Revenge of the Black Cloak Society, a King's Quest-based fic, Chapter 13, The Cat's Many Paws. Saladin blinked, slightly startled by the change of location. He had heard King Alexander command the djinn to transport them away from the ship, but the event had still surprised him. Regardless of that, he quickly gathered his senses and looked around. He could see the town of Port Bruce was not f too far away, and that meant that the Gorgons were also not too far away. He also took note that there was a cave nearby. He didn't want to take shelter in the cave, since the Gorgons might be using it as a lair. His eyes then landed on Alexander, and he could barely contain the gasp that wanted to pass through his lips. Alexander was on all fours, and while he was still human-shaped, he had gained a new cat-like feature. His king had sprouted a tail. For the briefest of moments, Saladin wanted to give in to the dog-like nature that his kind had. However, he held it in. His kind had made peace with those of the Kata years, ages ago. He focused on the situation when he heard Celeste say, Saladin, there are bears coming out of that cave. He turned to look at the cave, and part of him relaxed, but not totally. Three bears had emerged from the cave, but unlike other bears he had seen over the years, these bears wore clothes. He then remembered that Alexander had mentioned that there was a family of bears that lived in a house to the south of Port Bruce. Saladin moved to the front, just as the lead bear stopped and spoke. Is one of you King Alexander of the Green Isles? Before Saladin could ask, the bear continued speaking. If so, the oracle is waiting for you. If not, you can still come with us into the cave. The bandits and the gorgons are kept away from this cave. It's the safest place you could go right now. Instantly, Saladin went into action. He motioned for Alexander, Celeste, Shamir, and the crew of the ship to head to the cave. He noticed that both Celeste and Shamir were supporting Alexander. Obviously, the newest part of the transformation had taken a toll on the king. He glanced back at the bear and said, If you can help, it would be greatly appreciated. King Alexander has fallen victim to some foul magic. He saw the family of bears rush forward and start to help with Alexander. This allowed Saladin to cover the rear, since getting the king to safety was his highest priority. He moved backwards, watching the tree line. He knew this would be dangerous, since there would be no telling who would be approaching. The bandits would be easy to dispatch, but the gorgons were another issue. He was unsure of how far their powers reached. Once they reached the mouth of the cave, Saladin's ears picked up movement. He was certain it was a person, and he turned to face the direction he was sure the sound came from. As he did so, the youngest of the bears said, You won't have to worry now. They won't come into the oracle's cave. The oracle has placed a special protection on the cave. Not even a gorgon's gaze can reach it. Saladin nodded and he finally sighted the figure. It was certainly coming their direction. While it was far away, he could make out the details that told him what it was. He could see the writhing mass that was the snake hair of a gorgon. However, he noticed the figure also seemed to be hesitating, as if it did not want to pursue them. He watched for a few more moments, and then the figure started to back up. He could not be certain if she had seen them or not, but something told him not to worry. There had to be an ex explanation for the odd behavior, and for some reason he felt it was something that would benefit them. He then fully entered the cave, and he was stunned by what he saw.
Celeste paused, almost in awe at what she saw. She stood near Alexander and Shamir, but neither seemed fazed by what they saw. The cave, which would unnerve any winged one, was not as small as the outward appearances would suggest. She also noticed the huge number of people in the cave, some human, some non-human. It made her wonder how many people in the town of Port Bruce, where the ship was supposed to moor, had been able to avoid a terrible fate. As they started to move forward, she felt the unmistakable aura of a seer. Since she had started helping the Winged One's oracle, she started getting a new outlook on life. She had put aside the prejudices that her kind was superior to all. It helped open her eyes to the world around her, and since she had also had a vision. It had been a very disturbing one, from the time she was a captive of the Minotaur. She did not dwell on that, since at the moment they had to help save the land of Ludor. She did, however, lock her eyes on the Oracle. This being was not what she expected at all. The Oracle looked like they were part of the cave. In fact, she realized the oracle might be one with the land of Ludor. She also noticed that King Alexander did not even seem phased by the oracle's appearance. As he just politely bowed and addressed the oracle. Thank you, oracle, for giving us shelter at the moment. She saw the oracle nod and then heard the ethereal voice. It is what was meant to be, and I see that your actions year ago, years ago are now being paid back. The seers of many lands saw this would happen. They just didn't know who it was to happen to. A great darkness is at work. Something about those words snapped Celeste to attention. She recalled something her oracle had told her before she had volunteered to come with. She kneeled in front of the oracle out of reverence and said, Oracle, I am Celeste, one of the winged ones. Our oracle had said a great darkness was at work, one that had far-reaching goals, but she would say no more than that. She stopped speaking when the oracle raised her hand. I am aware of the darkness. For it is that darkness that has restored the wizard Mananan. Alexander and his family has drawn the wrath of this darkness, not just once, but many times. At that moment she heard a gasp come from Alexander, which sounded almost like a meow. She glanced at Alexander, who just said, The Black Cloak Society. She remembered hearing that Abdul Alhazred had been discovered to be a member of that group, but all endeavors to find out any information about the group and its members resulted in little or none. She then heard the ethereal voice of the oracle once again. Yes, a society that has been around for a long time, and quests for power and darkness. It has claimed many lands, infesting them with darkness and controlling them with fear. Luador had been one of the first lands held here. How in ever in recent years the group has had many setbacks, in part due to your family, but in other lands, like Mordovia and Spielberg, it was due to the effort of one man. It saddens me to see the fate of Port Bruce since the city flourished after shedding its dark past. Celeste gasped when she heard that and looked around at those who were in the cave. Many looked like they were from the city. And as she looked at them, she said, All of these people are from that town? And that town was? The oracle's voice echoed again especially as an image appeared on the crystal orb in the center of the cave. Yes, it is why it had been a haven for pirates. As time progressed, the people shed their evil, 
but it was still under the control of the Black Cloak's representative, who for a long time had been Mananan. Celeste let those words sink in. If the town and the land had been a safe haven for those who preferred to cause trouble, then the defeat of the Black Cloak Society's representative would have caused the good people to flourish. Her king had freed this land, and in turn earned the group's wrath. She came out of her thoughts as the image on the orb in the center of the cave started to clear. While the image was still fuzzy, she noticed that the head seemed to be covered in a writhing mass. As the image became clearer, instinct made her turn her head and shout, Avert your eyes! It's a gorgon! She heard several gasps and noticed people were doing so, even King Alexander. As they all did so, the oracle spoke again. It is all right. Their gaze cannot pierce the power of my crystal. I should also tell you that this one is not like the others. I felt her remorse when she cast her gaze on her own sister. Celeste felt a few emotions go through her at that moment. The first had been shame, since she reacted so quickly to the possible peril, forgetting that the oracle had already made sure the people were protected. The second was grief. Since she was sure that she would feel that if she had hurt one of her own family. She then turned to face the orb, determined she would be relaxed, but brave. The oracle noticed that King Alexander and his party were now putting their gaze onto the orb. He noticed a little apprehension in the guard dog, but he had already told them about the power of the orb. After a moment, when the image was in focus, the oracle was certain who it was. It was the same one that warned them about the attack. The image then said, in a voice that sounded like it came from in the cavern, Oracle, I have done something bad. I don't know if you can fix it. I petrified people of the town. I petrified my own sister. He nodded and just said, I am already aware of it. However, you were able to prevent more when you warned me before. For that, you should be grateful. It is lucky, however, that the spell can still be undone. Full petrification does not take hold until a complete moon cycle. The oracle noticed relief on the gorgon's face, as well as the people in the cavern. Then the gorgon's image faded, and King Alexander of the Green Isle said, it must have taken a great deal of power to have allowed the Gorgons out of the desert. Is that what is causing the petrication to take so long? The Oracle shook his head, and Alexander looked confused. You mean that the petrication is working faster? <laughs> the Oracle was about to answer when the Jinn spoke first. No, Master. Jinns are able to effect the change faster because of our more magical nature. Humanoid creatures like Gorgon can affect the change, but only instantly on the surface. Under the rock shell, the body slowly turns to stone. The people turned to stone by a Gorgon are usually dead within days, but they can be saved. It takes a special powder to do that. He was impressed by the jinn's knowledge, and then addressed King Alexander. Your jinn is right. However, it does take great power to barrier off the land. It is almost as great and dark as the force sleeping in the darker parts of the ocean. The truth is that the force that cast that barrier was not Mananan, but his superior Shadrach. The oracle paused as Alexander and his group all gasped in shock, and then continued, The dark wizard has been 
around for a long time and had suffered major setbacks in the lands of Daventry, the Green Isles, Tanalore, and many others. His Black Cloak Society has been weakened, but not defeated. Even now, he sets the next part of his plan in action. The Oracle glanced in the direction of Saladin, the captain of the guard dogs, as he growled, Then we will stop him after we defeat Mananan. My men will sniff him out, and he will answer for all his crimes. His minion, Abdul, almost tore the Green Isles apart with civil war. The Oracle nodded, knowing a little about that, but also knew that the plan Shadrach had set in motion was not one to stop right away. Before the Oracle could say any th something, though, the djinn blinked his eyes, and a panicked look crossed his face. Oh, dear! I remembered hearing about something from one of the djinns before they went malevolent. The oracle saw everyone turn to face the djinn, and the djinn focused on the oracle. It can't be that what Shadrach is invoking. The oracle nodded sadly. I must confirm your fears, djinn. With those words, all were facing the oracle. He knew this news would strike a blow, but if they went uninformed, it would lead to disaster. Shadrach has enacted an ancient evil spell. It requires the sacrifice of eight minions, and the result will restore them to a greater power as well as himself. What is worse is that it relies on the forces of good to dispatch the minions, and with each defeat the spell gets stronger. I fear that the only way to safely break the spell now is to let it run its course, and then challenge Shadrach. The oracle wasn't surprised when Alexander protested. In fact, the oracle knew it would happen. Surely that cannot be our only option. There has to be a safe way to stop the spell that is in effect. It can't be that dangerous to disrupt. Couldn't any of the kingdom's wizards stop it? The way Alexander spoke reminded the oracle that the young king had learned a bit of magical skills during his time as Mananan's servant. The oracle nodded, but then turned his attention to something far off. It is possible. However, it would require knowing all the details linked to the spell, including how he will bring each of his minions into the plan. Knowing that might allow the wizards to stall the plan long enough for you to strike at him. In the moment of silence that followed the statement, the oracle knew they didn't know those details. That meant that Shadrach still had an advantage, one that the oracle felt was being exploited at that moment. Since, from the oracle's vantage point, he could see some very odd points on the mountains at the far end of the desert. At that very moment, Shadrach was at the ruins of a castle in the mountains. It had been one he had been in before, back when the Dark Fairy Lalot was around. Of course, now it had been a little bit tricky to get into. To prevent anyone from finding the place, the good fairy Janesta had placed various wards to keep those out from the evil place. The only ones who could enter had been those who had entered by walking in. It was known by many that the fairies preferred flying when they could. Also, Lalotte had many flying minions to bring in her visitors. Shadrach didn't need any of those, 
nor did he have any trouble by passing the guardian measures. He knew the methods used by a low lot, as well as her own ambitions for power. He was even certain she would have a way to come back from death. Sadly, Cupid's arrow had done a good job of destroying her physical body, as well as any of her hate-filled spirit. He was certain, however, that when Princess Rosella of Daventry shot the arrow, she didn't bother to check for Lulat's true amulet. He knew Lulat put that amulet in a safe place. He just didn't know where. He felt the first place to check was in the fairy's bedroom. It was the room she died in, and when she was asleep, she had been the, had been the safest moment to kill her. He didn't rush in his search, since he had already put wards on the door back in Daventry Castle, to deter anyone from bothering the new royal historian. This part of his plan had been expected, but he had not expected it to happen so soon. Of course, he had forgotten about the books Manannan had in his library, and no doubt some of the wards, to keep the people from looking at them, had worn off. That oversight he would have to correct, but for now he had taken appropriate precautions. Speaking of precautions, Shadrach stopped and changed course. He went to the bedroom that had belonged to Edgar. He remembered when Lolotte had abducted the boy. She had told him about how she could keep any fairy compliant to her will by the item she had. It had been a sash that was linked to one of the ancient goddesses of beauty. However, it had been corrupted by her evil. When she wrapped it around an individual, they became ugly and submissive to her. Shadrach knew that would be needed again. While Edgar's room was now in disarray, he saw the sash right away and picked it up. It would be perfect for his plan to revive Lilat and the time he would enact the plan. He even laughed as he realized how poetic it would be. He then left Edgar's bedroom and moved to Lalotte's bedroom. Almost amazed that while the rest of the castle was in ruins, this room was preserved. He had no doubt it was due to Lalotte's amulet. In fact, he could sense the preservation emanated from the massive dresser in the room. In that moment, Shadrach knew Lalat had taken extreme precautions to defend the amulet, and it would take time to disable them all. He stepped back for a moment and paused, thinking which spell he should first use. After a second, he cast the spell, protecting himself at the last moment from the explosive reaction his spell caused. When the dust cleared, he chuckled to himself, saying aloud, Low lot, you crafty witch. You still didn't trust your colleagues. She had been right not to trust them, but in the end, it was going to be one of them that resurrected her. He then started to sift through the rubble for the prize he sought. Cedric awoke in a place that he never wanted to be again, in a cage. The last time he had been in a cage was when he helped King Graham and ended up caught by the Queen Isabella. At least this time it wasn't freezing, but the dark surroundings didn't offer him much hope. He was certain that the place was the lair of Shadrach, darkest wizard of the Black Cloak Society. He was also certain that if he didn't find a way out of the cage, he would be dead. That was a bad thing, since he was a familiar and his life was linked to Crispin's life. He started to look at his cage and noticed how old it looked. No doubt it would take a bit of pecking to get through the bars and he went right to it. 
Each time he pecked, he looked around, hoping no guards were about. He didn't doubt for a moment that he would have been left unguarded, since he now knew what Shadrach looked like. However, as he pecked more and made more pro made progress, the lack of sound made him think that there were no guards. It didn't take long before Cedric had managed to peck his way through the old bars. For a brief moment, the owl wondered if this was all part of a trap. He felt certain that Shadrach would not have left him unguarded unless there was some other trap in place. He took a tentative look around and then spied the table in a corner of the room. On the table, Cedric saw parchments all over, and despite the risk of recapture, he flew over to check them out. He landed on the table on one of the spots not covered and looked over it. Several of the papers looked like magical maps, each one of one of the major lands in the world. Some of them even had parts glowing on them. Cedric then gasped as he recognized the landforms on the map. My goodness, that's Daventry, Kalima, the Green Isles. He then noticed some of the other parchments. Each one had information all about the foes of the royal family of Daventry had thwarted, and something about reviving them. Cedric shivered and realized what it meant. He started to fly when he spied the last item and almost fell out of the air in shock. He had heard Crispin talk of a very dark spell once. He only knew that it could restore many dark wizards to power, but it required the deaths of those who would gain power. His master had said then that it would take a very powerful wizard to pull the spell off. He quickly realized what Shadrach's plan was and now he had a duty to warn the others. Of course, that would mean finding his way back to Daventry. He started to fly higher and finally spied a lone window. It was devoid signs of other birds, most likely because they could tell the evil that was in the place. He then flew up to the window and looked out. After a moment, Cedric grumbled under his breath, I'm nowhere close to home. If my guess is right, I must be near Orient Mordavia. I can't be sure which way to go. He then started flying towards the land in the distance. He shuddered as he recalled the history of the land. But this was an emergency. Everyone needed to know of Shadrach's evil plot as well as the death of Derek and the new youthful look on the wizard's face. The people had to know about this, and he was the owl to do it.